the Young Double Split Experiment. This is an experiment that was obviously used on light. And back when this experiment first came up, we were still trying to figure out what exactly light was. So we had light, and it was just this thing that existed all the time. And then we were trying to figure out if it was a wave or it was particles, you know, photons, little quanta. And there was a huge, huge debate going on in the field of physics about whether or not light was a wave or whether it was a particle, because sometimes it seemed to exhibit light as wave-like behavior or particle-like behavior. And this was one of the most important experiments that showed that light was a wave. Obviously now, we know that light is a wave sometimes and also a particle sometimes because it exhibits both characteristics and so we call this the the wave particle duality of light but back then we didn't know it and therefore when we came up with this experiment where we found out that light actually was a wave it was very brown groundbreaking essentially we have light that exhibits two distinct actions and that is first of all diffraction and that is the spreading out of a wave after it passes through a gap or around an edge, right? So if you pass through a gap, then this light would spread out. If you rounded an edge, then this wave would spread out. So that is diffraction. And then we have interference. So interference is basically where two waves, they meet at a point, and then their individual amplitudes are basically algebraically added together to make the amplitude of the resultant wave. And we were able to show that light shows both of these actions by using this experiment right here. So let's take a look at it. So what essentially happened was we took a laser beam, we took some sort of light, and then we passed it through this little cardboard with double slits in it, now, as the wave passed through, as the light passed through this double slit, after each individual slit, let's say this was like a slit, after it went through this, it would spread out to the space beyond it like that. So that happened for both slits. So you can see that there are two dis diffracting sources of light that is coming out beyond this cardboard. What then happened was that the slits were so close to each other that the light from both of them interfered. There was a part where they would intersect with each other, and in this part, they would interfere, which means that at some points, their amplitudes would add up. At some points, their amplitudes would minus. So that's generally how it goes. We see that there is the laser beam, the double split, and then we see that there is a diffraction of light and we have interference going on in this region, as we can see. And then when it hits another cardboard, we see something very fascinating. And these are called interference fringes. These are the interference fringes. This peculiar little pattern appeared when you did this together. Now, how could it be that we were giving out just a solid block of light coming out from each slit? And yet we had this sort of broken up pattern that formed. Well, that's because of interference. What essentially happened was that at certain points, these light waves, they would be on the same direction. So their amplitude would be in the same direction. This is both downwards. And so the resultant wave would be much bigger. They would be like the addition of both of them. At other points, the waves would kind of cancel each other out. So maybe they would go like this and then they would go down. So you see that one's going up, one's going down at this point. So if you meet the wall at this point, the resultant wave is going to be zero. There's going to be zero amplitude. And that is the dark little section that you see between the bright sections. So that was what was happening in order for this pattern to be formed. So what the scientists did was that they took this pattern and they said, okay, this is the proof. First of all, light diffracts because if it didn't diffract then this sh the the pattern that will fall will be just like this this would be the light pattern just the shape of the slits because it didn't spread out but it did spread out it spread out a lot so that's why first of all it diffracts second of all it also has an interference effect because some parts are brighter than other parts and therefore they were able to conclude that light 
was a wave. So now let's take a look at how that actually happened, right? From a more mathematical standpoint. Let's say these are the two slits. Now this spot is equidistant from both of them, which means that if you if you draw a line from here, I'm gonna draw it as straight as possible. Right here, you see that it's exactly at the middle of both slits. This point right here is going to have a very, very bright point of light. Maybe it's like this one or something. The middle one. Now, why is this so? It's because what happens is that since this point is equidistant from both of the slits, the waves coming here have traveled exactly the same amount. Which means that, let's say they travel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five, this guy will also have traveled five. One, two, three, four, five. And you see that they're going in the same direction at this point. So they're in phase when they meet at this bright spot, which means that, you know, obviously we add these two up. The overall amplitude is going to be this big. It's going to be very big. So that's what makes the light so bright. So there is constructive interference at the bright spot. Now at the dark fringe, which is over here, and that you can see that there are some dark parts, right? That's what we're referring to right now. The path difference is one and a two lambda. Now, what does that mean? It means that at this point, this light has traveled just a little bit more than this one. And therefore, they're at a position where their amplitudes are the opposites of each other and they cancel each other out completely. So let's take a look at how this might happen. Let's say this one travels maybe six times. One, two, three, four, okay, fine. five times. It's traveled five times. And then this guy would travel one, two, three, four, five, and then it would travel a half, half of a wavelength. So what, that's, that's what we're looking at here. This guy traveled this much more than the guy underneath it. So the path difference, and the path difference means like the amount of in wavelengths that this wave has traveled, right? Or this light has traveled. The path difference is one out of two lambdas, which means that it puts them at exactly a opposing directions. So that's what you should remember. When the path difference is 1 to lambda, they're put at, the amplitudes are at exactly opposing directions, the displacements of their particles at the exact position. So they will destructively interfere and the overall amplitude will be zero. Now let's take a look at what happens at this third point, which is the second bright point. Over here, let's say this guy's traveled one, two, three, four, five, six. Traveled six. Over here is going to travel seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see that they are going at the exact same direction, up. So the resultant amplitude would be going up by a much bigger amount, and therefore they have a bright spot again. So which means that when your path difference, and, and you know, this one, the path difference was zero, this one path difference was 1 or 2 lambda. This one is 1 lambda. When the path difference is multiples of lambda and not like half lambda, then they're going to constructively interfere. So that's what the most important takeaway. And this is the same for multiples, right? So if the path difference was 4 lambda, they would constructively interfere and it would become brighter. If it was five and a half lambda, it would destructively interfere and it would be dark. And, and basically, you just got to look at whether or not it's multiples of a whole number or multiples of halves. So now let's take a look at this one more diagram. These two are the slits, as you can see. Now, this D, capital D, is the distance between the slits and the cardboard, wherever the interference fringes are forming. A can be set at to be the distance between the fringes, and X is going to be the distance between two bright fringes. So this one's dark, remember? We're going to ignore that, two bright fringes. The most interesting thing about this is that we can actually get what is the wavelength of the light if only we knew A, D, and X. And the equation is this, lambda is AX over D. 
which is pretty bizarre, but here's how to derive it. So take a look at this diagram right here. This is what is happening. There are the two slits, and the rays from both of them are going here. This is D, obviously, and that's 90 degrees to the, the cardboard with a slit. We have X, which is the distance between the equidistant point and the first uh, fringe, wherever that forms. And then we have A, which is the distance between the slits. So first thing we need to realize is that the path difference is lambda. So the path difference between R1 and R2 is going to be lambda because, and it has to be that way, because they're going to meet at the first bright fringe. So obviously, if you want it to be first and then also bright, it's going to be a multiple of lambda. And because it's the first point, it's going to be one lambda. So we can clearly see that the difference between R1 and R2 is this point over here. So that we denote as lambda. Now there are two triangles that we have to be looking at. And it's this triangle right here, the small triangle, and then this triangle right here, which I call the big triangle. The angle between the, the ray and this, this um, the D one is basically going to be theta. And that's what we're gonna denote it as. And if this is theta, then we can also say that this is theta as well, it's the same. And obviously this is 90 minus theta, which gives us that is theta. So basically we have theta here and theta in the small triangle as well, and this is lambda. Then we get this equation where sine theta for the small triangle is lambda over a, that's a small triangle. And that's our first equation right here. And then, Let's look at the big triangle. Now, something that we need to assume right now is that we're going to say that uh, theta is going to be really, really, really small. Also, just a heads up, we also assume that these two rays were parallel because we assume this because they were so close to each other that they were actually kind of parallel. Because imagine this, the slits are over here and in reality, the, the cardboard is like somewhere like this and then the slits are like that big. And if they want to go to one point, they're going to have to travel like this together, which means they're almost parallel together. They're actually not like this and then they have like this... And then like this, you know, obviously they're not parallel in this very exaggerated drawing. But in the reality of the experiment, it looks more like this, where the, the distance between the slit and the cardboard is really big and the slits are very small. So we assume that these two are parallel and that's how we got, you know, this also equals theta, right? And then we're going to assume number two, which is that theta is very, very small. When theta is really small, let's say theta is like this small. And so it goes like that. This, this, this line right here, it almost becomes the same as D, this line right here. You know, tangent theta is obviously going to be x over D, right? But we're going to say that, okay, let's say this is like R1. Let's put this as R. Sine theta is going to be x over R. But we assume that theta is so, so small that r almost equals d. So sine theta is also x over d, which means that sine theta is exactly the same as tangent theta. Then we have this interesting thing where now we can substitute this equation. Sine theta is lambda over a, and then tangent theta is x over d. However, sine theta equals tangent theta. And hence we get this and this equals together. So x over d is lambda over a, which gives us ax over d equals lambda. And that's how we derive this equation. You might be wondering, why not just use two different lasers and then allow the light to diverge like this? and then use that cardboard right there. Why do you want to go through the painful process of using one laser and then using this cardboard and then only getting two sources of light? Well, that's because of something important called coherence. Now, coherence is 
basically where there is a constant phase difference. This means that the frequency of both lights, their frequency is the same and it remains the same. So when your frequency is the same, the positions of both waves are going to remain the same. So you can see that the frequency is the same because the wavelength of these two waves are the same. Remember that the waves are moving this way. So they're going to move to become very big, the resultant, and it's going to become like this and then go up like this. But the position in which this happens will not stay, it will stay the same. So you can imagine the little fringes to, like let's say you have fringes like this before, it's going to constantly become bright here and then bright here and then bright here and then bright here. But they're not going to move about, you know, in this direction. However, if you had different frequencies, then everything would change. So let's say you have different frequencies. Currently, they have an upwards, um, upwards amplitude that adds up constructively. However, if you just move it a little bit forward, this is still going to be going upwards while this is going to be going downwards because the frequencies are so different. So it's going to follow this very weird pattern where it goes up and down and it's like it's just very hard to follow. So we can't follow the, the, the way that these fringes appear when their frequencies are different. So coherence makes it so that the fringes are stationary and measurable. And coherence also needs a constant phase difference. Their frequency is the same and remains constant. So basically we're using the lamp because we know that every single light coming out of this has the same frequency. Um, whereas if you lose, use two different lamps, they might have different frequencies for each lamp. And if they were the same amplitude, the complete destructive interference would make observations clearer. Now, here's just an additional point. If you had white light, then it would be really bad because white light contains all sorts of frequencies. And remember, you only have to have one frequency when this experiment is done. So what we do is we put a monochromatic filter, which is basically filter that all only allows one color to pass through. So one color equals one frequency. And then you put that over the double slit and then you do the experiment all over again. So I think you know, with that additional note, that's about it. It's a very interesting experiment that helped to revolutionize what we think of as light. Uh, I hope it helped. Thank you for watching.